<laughs> okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you again for being here today. We are absolutely pleased and honored to welcome Professor Didier Bigot today for the third keynote of this conference. And I would say that it is a particular honor to me uh, to chair this keynote, as my supervisor is no one else than Dr. Emmanuel Vierpitel, previous research assistant and PhD student of Professor Didier Bigot at Sciences Po Paris. You can just imagine how calm and relaxed I was when my supervisor kindly suggested that I would do this introduction. Uh, so, Professor at King's College London at Sciences Po Paris, previous vice president of the International Studies Association, co-founder and editor of the famous quarterly journal Sculpture et Conflit in France, but also International Political Sociology with Rob Walker, whose first editorial has now become a classic of the literature. Professor Bigot is thus both a prominent and groundbreaking scholar of the contemporary disciplines of international relations and security studies. And paradoxically enough, he is so because his work has never precisely ceased to challenge them on the topics of mobility, conflict, uh, uh, fundamental rights, we have a particular emphasis on uh, the relationship between external and internal security, as well as on the practices of surveillance and policing. It is a true pleasure and an honor to welcome Professor Bigot today. So, Professor Bigot will give us a 45 minute keynote entitled GPS Square Security and its New Global Positioning System Global Preventing Security. So, please join me giving a round of applause <laughs> to Professor Bigot. <laughs> So I will try to explain a little bit more this bizarre title, GPS Square. <coughs> but of course, what is at stake is certainly a form of transformation, of change about what we call security. And this idea is that maybe it's like the GPS, the Global Positioning System, you try to locate, and you never locate really well. Hmm? And this global positioning system is at the same moment another GPS, Global Preventive Security Surveillance. And so I will try to go with you and to do this travel and to find if we we succeed to have this GPS. Does it work? Does it not work? So security practice and their relationship to mobility and freedom are changing. Security seems to expand globally, global, and to reach a future prevention. So, this calls for an investigation into the implication of these ideas that a change in securitization practices is happening. It's not sure. We cannot just assume that it exists. It's necessary. It's not sure. And would lead toward the benevolent control of all forms of flows good capital, persons, information, in the name of protection and prevention. I know a lot of people believe in human security. What is this human security? Could we put the two together simultaneously? So how can we interpret this series of very diverse practices that claims to be an all-encompassing security that is global, limitless, primary, and preventive. Whereas in the past, because you can pretend that only when you recreate the past as a different past, it was sufficient for security to be what? To be national? to be bounded territorially, to be liberal, and to be punitive. So do we have or not a change in terms of positioning 
of the security argument and of its logic of justification. This lecture proposes a response to the pressing question by outlining some of the transformation of contemporary security practices that has resulted from a protracted process of insecuritization that cut across different social worlds. The military universe, but also the intelligence groups universe, about police and border guard social universe, judges and penal lawyers, but also ICT universe, or even mobility, health, consumption. So we have multiple social worlds. And these multiple social worlds have a tendency to de-differentiate, to become hybridized. The very traditional notion of military different from policemen is at stake. The idea that private and public, you can always make the different, is at stake. So what is at stake is profound notion of state, of government, of private, as if they can continue to be mobilized as form of explanation, when maybe they are not. So why do they do that? Maybe, maybe it's under the pressure of these assemblages of insecurity that connects, that blends, that homogenize them. But, and that's my thesis, it's superficially only. So, and that's the second central element. The scene layer of homogenization that this claim to be global preventive creates pervades the discourses, the programs, political and professional programs, the system of justifications, but the different social universe, the different fields, still keep their strong specificities in terms of practice, and all of them affect also in return the process of insecuritization. So you don't have a big securitization theory that pervades everywhere. On the contrary, it's always retransformed, reconfigured every time by the specificities of the different social universe. So in each field, actors enter into competition for the definition of what security means, but more importantly, what security does and what insecurity is, framing differently the boundaries between security, insecurity, and fate. And maybe I will come back to this idea of fate that now we call resilience, in their own domain of expertise. So no one accepts that the measures, the missions, the routines they perform have to be replaced by other ones because of transformation of insecurity. Different professionals which were previously marginal or non-existent consider on the contrary that you have a new context that have emerged. They have interest on that. Let me give you an anecdote about the gendarmes. The gendarmes in France were considered as sub-military and sub-policemen. Hmm? They were really on the margin of the two universes. To be a gendarme was to be a joke hmm? on both universes. But now the gendarmes say we are half policemen and half military. And we are exactly the kind of force you need if you have a merging between war and crime. So we are the most important one. 
I continue to love. But I'm the only one, no? Because everybody takes them very seriously. So we have to think about who are the heirs who have no interest to produce a discourse about change, and who are the pretenders who have a lot of interest to produce a discourse about globality, about change, about the transformation of threats, about the transformation of security to answer this so-called new threat, and to see how as academics, we position ourselves into the competition about definition and meanings. So what is at stake is that we have a tension about the hierarchies of the most legitimate struggles. What is really important? Is it counterterrorism or is it climate change? And then you see immediately this American scene and how these kind of elements can go on. Go to Albania. Well, it's not counterterrorism, it's global organized crime. And then the competition terrorism is a sublet subject of organized crime. Go to other places. Well, why about organized crime? It's about political corruption. And so each of groups will have an interest to say the threats we have are the really global one. Yours are only sublet of what we are doing. So we have certain need to think about what is at stake when people are doing that. What are the groups which produce this discourse? And it seems that this kind of struggle have not been systematically addressed. Very often, security studies, and even some of the critical IR security studies, take discourses. They speak about the discourse. They speak about discourse formation. They look at the contradiction between the discourse formation and they position themselves without thinking about what is the reflexivity of their position concerning the position of the actors themselves. We are not in an ivory tower. Every form of discourse that we produce is reproducing struggle inside the security field. It looks very banal in sociology. It looks extraordinary in IR theories. And that's where it is very important maybe to continue about that. Why? Because if not, what is the tendency? It's to have a teleological vision of history, where dystopia is a future that tends to acceptance and resignation or to a romanticization of resistance. It's everything will be accepted, no future in a new way. Global security has already won. Or it's all together we need to resist, and as academic we will do a successful resistance against all the people of the world of security. Is it serious? I don't think so. So what is at stake is certainly need to have a more structural, in terms of genetic structuralism, and certain not, certainly not an abstract structure, understanding about what are the process of transformation, about this idea that we cannot just have an easy story going from national security to global security, or global risk, or even global catastrophes. It's not a linear process. Applying to a homogeneous social reduced to one global civil society. 
If we have to look at transformation of security, we have to understand what is at play between the hairs of national security and the pretenders of global security. We have to see the dialectical movements that link the simultaneously co-presence mm -hmm. and effects. We have to analyze how these effects are profoundly different in different social universes and reconfigure the processes of naming and doing in security practices. So we have to investigate a little bit about these so-called details which are so important that if we think in terms of heterogeneity, we never can homogenize them as if it was one element. And that's also a danger. Using dispositive, for example, makes sense if you keep the notion of dispositive as heterogeneity and not as a way to say in a different way, I have different combination of elements and I do a system with them. So to keep this idea of dispositive seriously, you have to keep the idea of this heterogeneity centrally in your mind. You cannot just do a generalization about it. So what does that mean? That means that, yes, in the name of global counterterrorism, for example, it's possible to detect a trend of convergence, military, police, border guards, experts on computer systems. They are more and more working together. And they are all under logics that make them agent of the intelligence services. So we may say that, yes, you have something as predicting the future. Yes, you have this idea that security is not anymore about military forces, but to detect where is the enemy. To have this vision that it's a police detective work, but not a police detective work in terms of knowing after the crime what happened, but what will happen. That's where you have all these stories about the minority report of Philip K. Dick. Hmm? It became, but people look at the movie. They don't read the novel, and the novel has a very different end. Maybe we can come back to that in the discussion. Because what is at stake is that at the same time security is mixed up with technology of surveillance, commodification of objects, with <laughs> providers of security, with security actants, which are often digitalized, virtualized. Therefore, the traditional meanings of security, the use of force to counter the violence of an enemy, Raymond Aron, are shaking. They are obliged to encompass new definition about who is an enemy, who is national, what is sovereignty. That all brings ambiguities and uncertainties. So the enemy being transformed on any danger that may affect a population, the national becoming often a regional arena and pretending to reach the global. The sovereign being assessed by grouping of governments and transnational prof professional guilds more than by a specific national government. The idea of state secret. What is the raison d'etat if reason has disappeared and if the state has disappeared too in terms of who has the capacity to define them boss? Who are the spokespersons of an unchallenged state having national interest? So mobility can be read as a danger, more than an opportunity. As soon as mobility is not synonymous of more profit for the receiving space, you can see that mobility becomes a vector of potential contamination of the body politics. 
security is change, and that's really the permanence of this kind of line where the body politics continue to be there as a metaphor, but nobody knows where, where are the limits of the body. The body is dissociated. So security is changed into search for traces of previous movements, anticipation of new ones, and it's less and less a rapport de force between military forces. Localization becoming more important than a superior weight of force. Health is shrinking into an insecuritization logic. Fear of epidemics, mutability of viruses. But at the same moment, security is also invested of medical signification. And the period of the Cold War was purified security from this metaphor which were overwhelming existing in many periods are coming back. So the everyday practices of buying food are transformed into an inquiry about their provenance, quality of their biopurity, and traceability. You go to the supermarket, you are an activist on a security stake. You look, where is your beef coming from? You are absolutely committed to know better about the traces of this beef. And you want to change from beef to chicken. Oh, that's dangerous. And you want to change to some crops. Well, that's also dangerous. So what are these activities which are permeated? At the same moment, it creates this idea that the insecurity become a form of unease, permanently there, difficult to escape, but also difficult to be mobilized for an action by professionals of different kinds. So I play with a metaphor that contemporary security resembles a new ice age reducing the liquidity of the network that innovates the social universe of society and plugging the chinks between them. Iceberg of contemporary security clogs the flows of mobility and freedom of movement and opinion that information technologies and telephone are to the contrary liquefied and accelerated. So security as a form of rocks that limits liquidity of the world. These rocks of security transform information and is exchanged into problems of unknown. Bits of information, of their coherence in space and time, of their traceability and the possibility of surveillance, of strategy of control and prevention of these impossibilities to connect the dots. But despite efforts, of assembling different forms of knowledge, going from satellite surveillance to individual psychology and technologies of biometric identification. It is impossible, and that's also my thesis, to pretend to have simultaneously the content of information, the identity of the person that has produced this information, and its present localization. You cannot have the three information together. You cannot do a GPS. No global positioning system is possible. And it is this impossibility which is at the heart of the discussion and tensions of contemporary security. It assesses the very legitimacy to call this practice security or to call them surveillance, control, violence, death. Peace and security are named for violence and war. See what Meek was saying. It obliged to a different vocabulary, insisting on the co-constitution of security and insecurity. And that's why this notion of insecurity is not just a word game. 
This is the only way to take the magnitude of the dream of the security operators to control the future and its impact in our lives. It's a dream that the professional of intelligence and surveillance have to build a program that can decipher all the dots pertaining to this global preventive surveillance. And from this absolute knowledge of a moment in time of all the element in space, like a Maxwell demon, to have the possibility to deduce the future of each piece and to reduce tendentially to zero the part of hazard of human action in the elaboration of the futures to come. This dream has always been there, of course. Astrology has never disappeared. We are all Aztec sacrificial priests that try to decipher the future by killing people. And this dream of the bureaucrat to do that through scientific technique and to say that they have expertise, that they can do that because they have technology, because they know about the statistical trends of the past, because they have a willingness to know, because they have the possibility to predict what will happen is centrally important. And of course, some part of knowledge of technology goes that way. But you have certainly a confusion between, for example, the forecast of futures, multiple futures, and the strategy to say that you have the prediction of the behavior of certain individuals. Because it's insert into the idea of forecasting, the idea that you predict an event. That you are the PD. You know the future for sure. You know the future as if it's a past future. In French, we say futur antérieur. Future perfect as perfect future. So this is why you introduced centrally victims sacrifice, prejudice, discrimination in the heart of the process of evaluating danger. That's what risk management is about, to mask the sacrifice that everybody is doing by doing this logic of security. And this is why this global preventive surveillance is an impossible objective. It's a lie that kill. It's a Kafkaesque logic. You put in decision more and more innocent people. But instead of saying innocent people, what do you say? False positive. If you compare with the previous form of national security and their cynical vision of national interest, the form of violence are different but you have as much form of violence that you had before. So if the narrative of global terror and the necessity to launch a war against terror itself has accelerated the technologization of this dream and put it effectively in motion overtly, this dream has certainly begun largely before with the massive possibilities opened by computerization and the use of these possibilities, which were always limited for technical, political, and ethical reasons. So of course, it's not the technology, but the belief that you can use the technology at its maximum, that you have no limits. So I use, like, the formula of the Jeremy Bentham Panopticon I find a text that I consider the equivalent of Jeremy Bentham Panopticon, that the total information awareness of Joint Pond Dexter 2003 document. Because it describes in some way the dream of the program 
the rationality which innerves all the local one. You want to understand what is about the PNR passenger name record. You want to understand TFTP. You want to understand the SWIFT scandal. You want to understand Snowden information. They are very different particular programs. But you have, through the total information awareness, a way to read them, to read the connections of the disconnections. So it's really important to see that we have to still to understand the formation of this global preventive security argument to deconstruct the practical regime of justification it sustains, to analyze a form of knowledge, the groups of professional technology and everyday practice that builds a complicity and indifference of population and that form a subjectivation passing through an obedience to the practices in the name of their inevitability, as well as the episodic resistance emerging from all the social universe that try to subvert this understanding of necessity. The case of PRISM, for example, is certainly exemplary <laughs> of this moment where national and global preventive form of insecuritization joins their logic to silence the whistleblowers that emerge from the ICT world and their long-standing approach of a certain kind of idea of freedom of internet. The contradictory logic of security goes together to silence what could be the possibility, why do we have from the ICT world form of resistance about what is the internet? What is this notion of freedom? It's not as it's maybe not a naive, an idealist. It's just someone working with a specific habitus related to internet practices. So, the dispersed rock of information that insecurity forms creates maybe a new cocktail of GPS, global positioning system of a global preventive security, that tries to connect the dots, that tries to colonize everyday life in a logic of insecurity, that try to liaise the different liquid into an homogeneous formula. But that cocktail clearly does not match. Because no system can pretend to have a clear knowledge of the three elements of this global positioning system <coughs> concerning content, identity, and localization, permitting a mapping of the world and its future. So the wide icy layers of homogeneity cracks under the pressures of different colored liquids and the wide deaths of this insecuritization process did not succeed to stifle the resistance of the diverse, diverse social world. So, we certainly have to critically understand why, when, how the colonization by this insecuritization process of different social fields, which were in the past kept at arm length from the coercive institutions that were the parangon of national security, as happened and how it evolved. Why do we have health, insurance, risk, finance, bank, organizing now this logic as if they were army, police, custom, border guard, with new professions emerging? You are you are in health, but you monitor. You are in bank, uh, what you are doing, you do security, and you spend your time with intelligence officer. You are in finance, and what are you doing? You are doing, in English it's even better, securitization, of course. Hmm? It doesn't work in French. <laughs> So, in a nutshell, 
This form of securitization in securitization that claims to be global preventive, itself secured through surveillance, is grafting itself onto each and every practice of the different social world with the consequence of de-differentiating them, hybridizing them. But empirically, the police works through transnational networks that extend beyond national territorial borders. The military want to be and are involved into internal security. Intelligence services indiscriminately accumulate more and more so-called raw information for the pur purpose of further deeper analysis. Additionally, security as a business is flourishing and criminologists, biologists, climatologists, as well as computer engineers are called upon to intervene and predict. So, once again, it seems that this process has led to a blending and hybridization of the different technology of power, biometrics, visual surveillance, communication interception, digital data mining, data valence, profiling, sensors, location determination technology, non-lethal armament, drones, and in different terrains, counter-subversive operation, peace enforcement, enforcement, crime control, border control, and you have the development of the para-private rationally that blends public and private in an inextricable way, very removed from any official idea of an equal partnership between public and private. Private military companies, security firms, industry of internal security, banking intelligence, airport security. This colonization, once again, seems to leave, therefore, these IC uniform layers made of authentication, identification, detection, monitoring, tracking, gathering, intelligence linking, profiling categories, and predicting behaviors. And you can see this logic of the TIA, and so I just gave you the list of how to do it, which is there. So, it looks absolutely impossible to resist. But it's a very thin, uniform layer, which is partially erasing some of the political difference between right and left. Who can bear to say that the left is not in this program? That they defend freedom versus a security which would be re reactionary? Converse Conservative or progressive? Oh, they are more or less the same, no? Security and freedom? Oh, you need to have security first to have freedom. So everybody in the political class is claiming to be in favor of the implementation of these transversal techniques, considering that young generation, in any case, Love this surveillance that they transform into fun and self-surveillance, and that they will not change their votes because of privacy concerns. So, like a glacier, melting the different rocks, it changes the morphology of the different social universe once it has become established. It covers over the very mountains of the coercive institutions army, police, judicial system, prison, and softens the highest peaks of war and police arbitrariness with a self-appointed humanitarian military security declaring to be concerned with minimalization of death resulting from combat, protection and prevention of catastrophes, and a particular attention to the victim when managing violence in cities. At the same time, it transforms the values of freedom, opinion, movement, information, by filling them with this icy component of surveillance and organize the path by which the milieu can channel and filter the slowest flows more than ever. So as a result, we can still move quickly on the well-controlled roads, but the secondary roads are cracked 
and have become harder to navigate. And their detainment can become indefinite. Glaciers have also formed in the way of advanced custom clearance, pre-border check, digital authentication. Space has been transformed into time. So this form of GPS leads to serious consequences of limiting and sometimes inversing the quasi-continuous process of differentiation that has characterized the way in which the state has slowly embraced society through pastoral and protective microphysic of power, inciting subjects to exercise their freedom and to adapt to a certain liberal understanding. So far from being a simple effect of a neoliberal logic, this GPS works exactly against it and reformulates not only security and its security, but also freedom and democracy understanding. Plurality, heterogeneity, individualization are taken into a net of data technologies that play with the capacity of zooming from big data perspective to individual perspective. The individual disappears under its data double. The liberal dimension is inverted and subverted. Therefore, the protective dimension of state responsibility has to adjust. The individual will have to learn how to protect himself from the eventuality of danger. He will have to be more resilient in the face of catastrophe and to the unknown effects of securitization practice that are conceived to protect he will have to accept that these measures may be ineffective, despite the assurance of maximum security. Similarly, he will have to acknowledge the positive role of the security operators, regardless of how this will impact his fate. This new post-illiberal subject must then actively cooperate with the local and international operator of this, shall we say global humanity operators, international institutions, NGOs, banks, professionals, continually working to improve his own security as well as global security in a context of uncertainty. So he must understand that this trial makes him stronger, freer, because of his obedience. He now plays a part in his own protection and is expected to understand that he is ultimately the only responsible. The institution have just to help him to, strength, to strengthen through preparedness. He must not blame them. If they fail despite the promise of the maximum security program, his new life of resilience is an initiation to a new global managerialism where he exists only as an isolate of a statistical category, as a unit of an aggregation of individuals, i.e. a population, and not as a human made of blood and soul. He is ultimately defined not as an individual, but as a dividend, he is a result of a unique number produced by the combination of statistical categories that analyze and surveillance techniques have established. His freedom is no longer either positive or negative. Freedom is mainly what he gets within the bounds of the global insecuritization process depicted by the different guild of professional of Venice. So, I don't develop about the data organization and the online versus the offline or the relation between them. But I want to conclude with this idea that once again, all this pervasive element is a program, not a diagram. It's the dream of a group of professionals who have interest that the dream is pervasive. But this dream is, of course, nightmarish. And 
the practices of each local field destabilize, destroy, cracks this I see but very thin layer. The possibility on each field to resist, to block, is permanently there. Far from creating a successful program of biopolitics controlling humankind, as suggested by different authors, the GPS security is a form of de-governmentalization. It destroys any idea that governmentality could be a conduct of conduct. He lost the point. It's not acting upon action. It's acting upon action which are still in their virtualities. So the paradox is that the more the will of control happens, the more the offline world is out of touch. You have a circularity between the will of totality and the will to control the virtual and its simulation. You simulate. And the practices become freer and freedom in terms of resistance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bigot, for your keynote. A very definitely inspiring one. And I hope the audience will have a lot of questions for you. Uh, I will take them one after one for uh, Professor Bigot to have the time to answer them properly. So, do you have any questions? Yeah. Francesco? Just, um, uh, thank you very much, uh, DJ, for, uh, for the lecture. Uh, Sigmund Bauman, uh, in his lecture, insisted a lot on the question of inequality. And so I was wondering, in your work, how do you see the question of economic inequality uh, being a part or being made maybe a factor of the development of specific forms of of specific practices of security. I answer immediately. Yeah. Well, clearly, <laughs> that's the other chapter. <laughs> One of the key elements about the capacity, of course, of organizing this, why this layer of security, which looks so pervasive, is not so important. Because this question of security is not the central one. The question of distribution of the relation between equality and justice are more central than any form of security. Freedom, equality, and the connection between the political judgment about them is more important. That's a traditional lesson that we learned. But it looks like everything coming back with this question of inequality is now read as if it was a sublet question of security, of safety. I need to be resilient, so, well, if, the, if we have inequalities and structural domination, it's not their fault, it's also my fault. So it's against that, that clearly, in different social groups, you have resistance against that. But it's even not resistance. It's the majority of the practice are not about security. They are about struggles, about workers' places. It's about the situation in cities and homeless people. And they don't care. Uh, to transform the homeless people into a question of security is a joke. It's not about that. It's about the violence of the relation in terms of inequality, which is serious. 
And we have to work on that. So yes, it comes as a central question. The central question, where is this magmatic forces? Mm -hmm. The magma, I use Cornelius Castoriadis' idea of magma. Mm -hmm. The volcano of the magma is always creating a force of magma which just even the most important glacier is destroyed by the magmatic forces of volcano. So I play a little bit with this metaphor, but not too much. <laughs> I try to I try to limit myself. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Hugo. Any other questions? Yeah. things which are taken out of the realm of security and security. It's not a, a binary world, you know, the same as the other. Security, insecurity. You cannot draw a map of the world between security and insecurity. Because most of that is not taken like that. All the doxa are taken for granted. We all die. Very difficult to say. We can challenge now through the securitization of health that we don't know exactly when we die. Is it when we stop our of art is stopping? Is it when our brain is moving? But the idea is that we, we have to live forever is still not in the debate. You have a kind of fate which is there, which foreclose the debate. Um, in some way, what is interesting is that this notion of fate, which was highly religious, and which has been very, has been transformed through the secularization. And not so long ago, if you look at Jean Delumeau, until the late 19th century, even the beginning uh, before 1940, you have still celebration of what is fate and why it's to the religion to do that and not to, to the state. And we are going back to that. A certain kind of discourse about managing and resilience is about that. What is the new name of faith? Be resilient. It's your faith. Whatever we do, even if you die, say thank you to the security operators. We have done our best. Believe, continue to believe in us, even if you die. You have a long theological system about that. And I suppose Mick would be even better than me to speak about it. <laughs> Thank you again, Professor Digo. Uh, we had a question uh, at the top there, if I'm not mistaken. Did, did, did you have a question? No, there were no questions there. So. Yeah, uh, to there. Thank you. Um, you briefly mentioned um, the that um, sometimes terrorism is is actually a subject to organized crime. Um, now, I'm working on actually the dynamics of corruption in organized crime. 
and that sometimes like that actually organized crime can't live without corruption or the other. Does this actually? So I'm, I'm still thinking like you would actually start lots of ideas in there. So you talked about like this cocktail of chemical generality and that those liquids can actually work together and it kind of cracks. And I was thinking that in terms of all these different subjects as well, corruption, organized crime, terrorism, they often um, um, discussed in, in, as the same subject. Sometimes terrorism is um, defined uh, as organized crime. Um, often it's not. Um, does this actually uh, put limits to the discussion, or does it actually spark uh, uh, new dimensions? Um, are they actually intertwined or just interlinked? Um, well, <laughs> I would say that this point to look at the different threats and to say, do we have different threats, how they are constructed, and what is this other we are looking at is typically a way of thinking which I'm not so interested about. Because it's a strategy which is promoted by a group of people. So what I'm interested into is who has interest to create a connection between the terminology of terrorism and the one of organized crime, and for what reason? And very often, it's also a, a legitimization of form of action, form of mission, form of budget. So for me, to try to begin to decipher the question, like in some way a lot of securitization theory in Copenhagen have done, through the discourse, is just a way to reproduce the idea that you have this global merging between, for example, war and crime, where what is interesting is not that this discourse exists, but how it has been taken into form and for what interest. So I would say that my take will be <coughs> the rhetorics are there and the rhetorics are multiple. You have multiplicity of connection and disconnection in the discourse of threat. You don't create a big other. You create a lot of multiple little others which are exactly the one you want and that the other don't want you to have because they prefer their own little others. So the big otherness for me is quite an illusion. And what is interesting is to look at the strategy of the groups and the different professional of security. And I'm more and more now, uh, it's a criticism of my previous work, in some way I try to avoid to say professionals of security and I use the terminology of transnational guilds because the guilds have this capacity that it's not a profession, it's not institutionalized. It's a way of doing in a certain way your task. And at the same moment, it's really organized through patronage, through ritual, through myths. If we have to look at that, we will see that policeman is not a category. And I've made a terrible mistake for a while to speak about, at least I say policemen in networks. I'm very happy I can use the S of networks. It's not one, of course. That's the multiplicity of them. That if you are specialized in counterterrorism, you will always play a game where you will try to say, where are the best technologies? Where are where is the more freedom regarding justice? Which is the best way to define a policeman. I'm more free than you from a judge. Hmm? 
That's the logic of distinction. If I'm freer, I'm better. Because I'm not under the control of a judge. And all the anti terrorist guy will say, we are better than you because you are judiciary police. You are obliged to obey to the judge. And the criminal organizations, one on anti-organized crime will say, well, we invented before you the technologies. And they will speak about that. And that's where I am interested, because they will differentiate through strategy of distinction. <laughs> And you can see that their freedom, for example, is a way of freedom that we are not very happy to have. <laughs> Thank you again, Professor Bigot. Uh, yeah, a question just there. Um, hi. Um, I was interested at the end to talk about the idea of degovernmentalization. Um, and if you could just explain a, a bit about that in, in terms of resistance, because a lot of um, what you talked about throughout, in, in some ways, was more trivializing the idea of seeing, the idea of information, seeing everything, mm -hmm. the idea of um, shopping and being worried, worried about where our leave comes from. Um, and in this entering health, this entering more and more spheres, um, this kind of language of security and degovernmentalization, the idea that the ways were being surveyed, it, it's not acting upon action. And you, you said something at the end, I don't think you meant this, but almost there's different, uh, I know you don't mean this, more spaces for resistance or something like that, but what are the implications of resistance? Well. The terminology of resistance is always a little bit tricky. Uh, I'm not speaking about the Satrian logic of resistance and so on. It's more the multiplicity of people who are targeted, who are not victims. And they always, it's resistance in more Foucauldian sense, that you can see the effect of power at the limits of their application through the resistance. So resistance is first, and the power is second. Hmm? And uh, there, I can give you some anecdotes, because their anecdotes make sense. Hmm? What happens when you have, for example, a four years old baby, which has the same name that a famous terrorist? He stopped at the border. Of course, our border guard look at the name, look at the baby, who has the same name, and he knows, I assure you, I made an interview with, with him, he knows exactly that it's not the terrorist. <laughs> but he knows that he has nevertheless to perform the spectacle the battles, the baroque. Because in that case, what he says, well, I agree with you, it's not, but I have people up there. I need to call them. But of course, time difference, four or five hours. So the baby is stopped for five hours with the mother. She continues. She launched a claim. She launched a claim against the border guard, saying that it's scandalous. At the first trial, she wins. I sh shortened the, the story because it's a very long story. At the second level, what happened? Well, the administration was not so inhuman. What they have done? They have permitted to the mother to stay with the child. So you don't have lack of humanity. So no claim, no compensation. <laughs> this is this Kafkaesque move, which for me is the logic of resistance. It's not one individual. That's the structure of the situation where everybody looks ridiculous. Where, nevertheless, the violence against the persons have been terrible. 
and you have no excuse, you have nothing, you have a justification that even if it was ridiculous, it was. And that's this double element where resistance is there because you cannot multiply that. And that's it in each universe. You have plenty of that. <coughs> you cannot continue with evaluation through PowerPoint and Excel sheet. Some people come back and they say, I'm a living human being. I don't want to be evaluated the way you have evaluated people. I'm not your average category. So the critic is coming back through everybody on every time. Uh, we can speak even of higher education. Hmm? How is it possible that we accept the form of evaluation through average statistics? That we can accept that, for example, diplomas are a result of productivity. Is it the dream to sell a diploma just for money? with a high level of productivity because you don't need any professor and any student, you just go somewhere and you buy your diploma? Or do we think that it's not the case? And if it's not the case, and clearly it's not, if pedagogy is not that, the form of resistance are already there. The capacity of the power to apply this line cannot work. It looks pervasive, but it, it it, it cannot enter. It's a seam layer. And it cracks. And that's the structural element. We, we can speak about hospital and the situation in hospital. The multiplication of nurses who just stop to enter the element to fill the form because they consider that they don't need to spend two hours to fill the form to say that the clients, their clients now, are, have, have answered that they were happy. They prefer to spend time with them. It's all this form because I choose on purpose, hmm, not the traditional securitization form, but all this element of Pervasive. So the resistance are in all this social formation. I, I'm not sure I answered. I see that you are still. <laughs> Do you want to to come back or to you, no. you had a, something? Actually, that was really helpful. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, oh, thank you very much for, for the talk. Um, so l last week, uh, Jake Hyman's gave a talk where he was uh, talking about the diffusion of uh, security to various social fields. And he was also talking about how we should go and study this diffusion. So he was talking about methods, critical security studies methods. Mm -hmm. He was talking about method as device. Which was not very clear. <laughs> Do you, can you say some things about the, the methodology and the methods? How we should go out and study uh, <laughs> Well, uh, it really depends on what you call method. And I'm not sure that we have the same. We had a, we had a long discussion with Jeff, and as you know, we are we are very very uh, approximate. Uh, but he, he continues to make the distinction, I suppose, with episteme, theory, and method. And of course, uh, what he's saying in some way is that method is more than method, and that methods include, of course, a question of theory and episteme. And I will say, well, wonderful, I agree. But for me, it's, well, it's banal. 
uh, I, I'm not really surprised because, well, if you are coming from traditional political theory, you, you, you don't have that at all. If you work in humanities, you don't have this Mertonian, Parsonian, American vision that you have the theory, then the method, and then the case studies. Well, this three partition to have a, a scientific goal huh? between the trinity of the three with the holy spirit of the case studies which give you the possibility uh, to have your methods as an act uh, for me it's not really interesting what is interesting is more that if we have this kind of episteme what kind of approach what is the strategy of writing what is the art of writing my question is not about methods. It's what is the art of writing if we want to write a story? If we are storyteller, but a storyteller which are constrained by the idea of truth. We cannot just invent. And that's really Paul Venn approach. Hmm? What is history? It's a true detective story. So if it's that, if this art of writing is there, then we have to begin with the practices. And so how do you begin with the practices? You never begin with the individuals. You begin with the relation between individuals. We don't look at here and we say, oh, I will look at her, then at him. Uh, no, no, it makes no sense to begin with the agencies. It makes no sense to begin with the structure and the architecture. What is important, who are the people who continue to listen to me and who are the people who are tired for a while <laughs> and have stopped? Because there it's relational. Mm -hmm. And who are people now smiling and others saying, ha oh, ha, he has prepared the tree. Mm -hmm. So there, that's the invisibility of these relations that we want to visualize. And we want to create opacity on what? On the individuals. So what kind of methods? Plenty, because their method is techniques. First, but I suppose you have plenty of possibilities. The, the first one I was trained is certainly to do a form of ethnographies. And ethnographies are really important because you will begin with this immersion into the different social universe. You have to understand, especially when you are academic, that your first problem is that you think always that thinking is more important than acting. Well, Especially if you work on the military or police universe, of course not. <laughs> Kill someone first and try to find the justification after you're still alive. If you begin to think too much, the, the other will kill you. And that's, of course, the story that any military guy will say to you. And that's why you are an idealist. You, you are an academic, by definition, you are an idealist because you put your own habitus as the generalization of it. So reflexivity about what are the conditions of possibility of the, to study practices of a different social universe. How is it possible that we as academic don't translate all the world into our own categories of thinking, saying, ha ha, I have understood the world, it works like me. <laughs> well, most of IR is IR where I am connected with the world through internet and the newspaper and me. <laughs> and I write and I'm the world and I describe the world and because I describe the world, the world is what I describe. And you know this tension, of course, between IR and comparative politics or, or ethnography, for example. So I'm more an ethnographer on that sense, or I'm more a sociologist. 
because what I say is also a way to analyze sociologically. And then you have plenty of techniques, you can do that. You can do, of course, you are interested about the people, but not the people by themselves, but collective biographies. Biography one or two makes no sense, but collective biographies of group to see what are the structural properties of some groups and why they have some interest become really interesting. And what are the relations between the position taking? Why some people take some position? Is it at random or is it because they have interest? Interest to have disinterest. NGOs, for example. What are the profit of universalization of a position of NGO? It's so more interesting to say I'm there to save people than to say I'm there to kill people. It's easier to say I'm there to save people. Doctor Without Borders have a better image at the beginning. Well, at the end, I'm not so sure. So it's these kind of things that we can work as methods, but as a form of art of writing. And what is the art of writing? If it's about prediction, do I want my book to be a recipe for policy making? Already done. Do I want the book to give law of social sciences? Well, if it's that, forget anything I've said before. Go to see someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth Walls, for example. Or all I've ever loving Kenneth Walls. For me, it's already so difficult to give a little bit of voices of people who have been victims silence put away in histories which happened. Just not to be sure that you can do something more for them, but to create the condition of possibility for them to have a chance to speak again. That's what I would love if I succeed for once to do a book, because that's, that's why I'm, I'm not doing books, I'm doing articles and I stop in the middle of the article very often, because you have this indefiniteness. Hmm? So it, it's, it's about that. But that's more the project, so yes. Jean-Luc Nancy has said that really better than me, Rancière, plenty of other people, and Pierre Bourdieu. The latest Pierre Bourdieu was really linked with them, more than people suppose. <laughs> Thank you very much. We still have five minutes, so I will take one. Right. Uh, Michael did. <laughs> <laughs> um, you may I ask you to the question about methodology. Yeah. It gives me an opportunity. You know, okay? um, my first point to make is if you exercise a methodology, Michael Shapiro had a book out last year yeah. precisely the question yeah. of methodology yeah. in terms of critical methodology. Yeah. So I, I recommend the book. Yeah. Uh, there's more than one a methodology available, but it's not methodology of the Parsonian social scientific tradition or understanding methodology. So that's, that's the first point. The second point was. I was, I was wanted to come in to underline uh, a point and an anecdote that, that, that the DGA made, um, but it didn't seem proper to come in and underline a point that you made, but it actually relates directly to the question of methodology. Okay. And the anecdote is the four-year-old child, and, uh, uh, and the four-year-old child being treated, okay, not as innocent, which would arise in terms of one problematization of childhood, yeah? Innocence. But here, innocence is recoded. We used to say also, reproblematized. And one of the methodologies that Mike talks about in that book is problematization and reproblematization. 
So one studies, for example, certain security practices in terms of the way in which they problematize, re-problematize the world. And one of the ways in which this happens under what uh, uh, DDA is neatly calling global positioning system, that is to say through token surveillance and so on, one of the things that happens is the recoding of innocence as false positive. Okay. That's re-problematization. Yeah. And that's a methodology. So yeah. in general, you can generalize that. Because what you will find is that in different security practices, you do get transformations of categories. And transformations of categories is not just a conceptual and an analytical maneuver. It ends up with a baby being kept in detention for five hours. A final point would be you can you could take that even further because that reproblematization of innocence as a false positive discloses something else, which is that one social condition under a regime of total surveillance is transformed from innocence or any other category into permanent probation. Because false positive doesn't mean you're innocent. False positive is a conditional condition. You're under permanent probation. You may be, you may be actually a real negative next time around. Then you go through the security surveillance process. So, so problematization, reproblematization, and it seems to be that perfect illustration of how categories are transformed and recovered. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think we will stop there. Uh, thank you very much again for being here to, for this keynote, and uh, please join me giving a last round of applause to Professor Vigo. Thank you.